Friends, we're back in Romans today, back in Romans 8. We're going back again. I'm going to read a, a very, very well-known but very important section out of the middle of chapter 8. I'm also going to read a section out of Ephesians that that's, that's, many see as a very parallel passage to this. Uh, we won't touch on it, no, do more than touch on it in the sermon, but I thought it would be good to sort of help fill in Paul's ideas here. So we're going to read Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26 through verse 30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we really begin on the passage we're looking at, 28. And we know that for those who, God, who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son, in order that he might be the first born among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then Ephesians, the first chapter, beginning at verse 3, and we're going to run down through, uh, to verse 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us as adoption to himself, as sons through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, in heaven and on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might also be to the praise of his glory. In him also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If any of you remember way back um, to our first to our series on the five solas, Reformed theology, and I realize it was now like eight years ago, I admitted that for most of my years as a Christian and for many of my years as a pastor, I struggled with the idea of predestination, a word I will define for you in a bit. I didn't like the idea that my salvation was all God's idea and action. I thought I should get some credit for helping out at least a little bit by choosing to follow him my end. And I'm sure you know that is a concept that always starts a heated discussion among Protestants. And an idea that in a society like ours, with emphasis on personal free will, just kind of rubs us the wrong way. But in seminary, my systematic theology professor stopped in the middle of a class full of a bunch of young evangelicals to lecture us on predestination. Those of us who thought we did the choosing on the biblical facts of that dreaded word. And I knew at that point I had to come to some kind of functional understanding of it. About 15 years later, I remember visiting the bookstore at the Willow Creek Church in Chicago area. Then it was the largest church in the nation. And there I saw an audio tape from their pastor. Remember audio tapes? Um, their pastor, Bill Hybels, with a sermon with the title Predestination. Now, Bill was a great preacher, a good communicator. He was preaching actually on the same verses that we read today from Romans and Ephesians. And I knew Bill would just find a way to dismiss these texts, or at least water them down enough to set me at ease. And so I, I bought the tape, listened to it as soon as I got home. And to my dismay, what he says was that predestination is clearly taught by Paul 
and supported by lots of other parts of the Bible. And that while he could not really explain it in a way that satisfied him, he could not simply dismiss it. Predestination is a biblical truth. If God is in control, then God is in control. And my first thought was, dang. <laughs> Let me warn you, I really have too much to cover in one sermon, and I will not do these scriptures justice. But let me start with two definitions because the two of the words that we use when we talk about this are often misunderstood. We often use the word predestination to mean that God is in control of a direct control of every human action and all the events of, of history. In seminary, sometimes we do something, uh, usually something stupid, and then we joke, yeah, I was predestined to do that. Um, and, and while the idea of predestination is related to the sovereignty of God, it is not the same thing. When we talk about predestination, the idea comes from a Greek word that we heard several times, both in Romans and in Ephesians, uh, proorzio, proto, meaning what? Before. Um, and horizo, like the horizon, set a boundary to determine something Latin steals most of the word from Greek, and you get predestinare, before to destine. Thus, the idea is that predestination primarily means, in the text we find it in Scripture, to determine in advance how some event will happen. And really, that's something that only God can do in the absolute sense. It speaks of God determining our eternal destination. Predestination. Not so much God determining all of our human actions. We still have free will. But our free will does not offer us unlimited choices. You know, my wife and I often watch these stupid YouTube videos uh, from law enforcement's, you know, cameras that they wear on them. Uh, people be getting arrested. Um, I think you like to watch dumb people getting dumb results. Uh, and often as they are handcuffed and put in a police car, you'll hear the offender say, I don't want to go to jail. And almost always the officer's reply is, that's no longer your choice. And like us, when we rebel from God's rule, when our self-centered sin breaks our relationship with God, as it does for all of us, if we say, I, I want to go to heaven, or I don't want the alternative of eternal separation, the, the biblical answer is, that's no longer your choice. Only God can choose. So let me define another non-biblical term for you. I'm sure you often hear me refer to Calvinism. I know that most of you know that John Calvin was one of the Protestant reformers of the 1500s, the one reformer most associated with Reformed theology and Presbyterianism, although I'll tell you, Martin Luther wrote a lot more about predestination than John Calvin did. You might assume that the specific beliefs of Calvinists are something that then originated then in the 15th century, and you would be wrong. The Reformation was about rediscovering New Testament biblical truths that had been lost or obscured over the past 15 centuries. A return to biblical Christianity, not something new. And I love the way the great reform preacher Charles Spurgeon put it. He wrote this, he says, I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless you preach what is nowadays called Calvinism. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. I do not believe we can preach the gospel if we do not preach justification by faith without works, not unless we preach the sovereignty of God in his dispensation of grace, nor unless we exalt the electing, unchangeable, eternal, immutable, conquering love of Jehovah, nor, I think, can we preach the gospel unless we base it upon the particular redemption which Christ made for his elect and chosen people. It is no novelty, then, that I am preaching, no new doctrine. I love to proclaim these old doctrines, which are called by the nickname Calvinism, but which are surely and verily the revealed truths of God as it is in Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to think that Calvinism is some new idea. It's a shorthand way of defining a biblical Christianity articulated by Jesus, Paul, and other biblical authors, and later expounded on by Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and many others. At the heart of Romans chapter 8 is also the heart of both our understanding of predestination and what you might call Calvinism. 
it's been given the nickname the golden chain because in it Paul gives us an order of God's saving actions. You may sometimes hear the Latin ordo salutis, uh, the process by which he bestows his grace on us, adopting us as sons and daughters, lifting us out of our brokenness, giving us an amazing promise. And the amazing thing is that this was God's plan from before the very beginning of time. Let me read it again, starting at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and also sisters. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. I like how, what Tim Keller talks about this. He calls it a, a, a glorious, unbreakable chain. And he writes, now in Romans 8.30, Paul lays out a process by which God conforms his children to the likeness of his son. He lists five active verbs and describes what God has done. The key to understanding the verse is to use the controlling insight that each verb refers to, uh, the same set of people. It is not some of those he foreknew he called, or some of those he called he also justified, and so on. Rather, the same group God foreknows, he also predestines, calls, justifies, and glorified. It is not some or most, it is always those. In other words, all those. If one of these verbs applies to a person, then all do. And friends, here is what, again, he essentially says. That God foreknew us, that he set his love on us. That God predestined us, that God planned a glorious destination for us. That God called us, that God justified us. That God works out his plan of salvation and rescue and redemption through time. And then ultimately, we sometimes forget this part, God glorifies God glorifies by completing this great plan on into eternity. Now, let me just say, because there are many people who hate this, that some will suggest that the word foreknew, um, because God is not limited by time, God knows how all events and human actions will play out even before they occur. So God looks for people down through history who will of their own free will choose to follow him or think they are choosing. Um, and thus, if that's your view, it's not so much God deciding anything by himself, so much as God looking through time and knowing in advance what decisions humans will make on their own free will and then choosing or electing them. And I'll be honest, for a very long time, this is how I tried to at least deal with this passage myself. It doesn't really work. Really, when you look at the whole passage, and then especially if you're willing to let Ephesians also give you a little bit of insight. What does Ephesians write? Verse 4. Even as God chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself because he saw something wonderful in us uh, through Christ Jesus, according to the purpose of his will, not our will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in beloved. And then 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We're sort of left out of that. So that we who were the first hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And friends, let me tell you that that idea that we were the ones and God just sort of looked through history and saw us choose him really doesn't work when you get to Romans chapter 9. Now, you know that by now, I am a convinced 5.5 solus Calvinist. Um, that all said, I still struggle a little bit when I read chapter 9 because I think it's wrong or hard to understand, but because I still kind of don't like what it says. And, and we've already seen that in this letter that Paul anticipates sometimes the criticisms or questions about things that he's writing in his letter. And, and what he then does is he tries to answer them in advance. And I think many people who struggle with the idea of predestination, even many Christians will ask, you know, how, how is it fair that God chooses some people and not others? And apparently Christians wonder that 2,000 years ago too. And, and this is how Paul answers that in verse chapter 9. We're just going to read a few sections of that. He starts by telling stories, biblical stories. What then shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, 
and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says, Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name may proclaim to all the earth. So then as he has mercy on whoever he wills, he hardens whomever he wills. You will say then to me, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But he or you, O man, to answer back to God. Well, what is molded say to the molder? Some people say, what is made say to the potter? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make his power known, has endured much with patience, uh, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order that he might make known the riches of glory for the vessels of mercy, that's his children, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even as us whom he has called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Now, it still doesn't sit well with me, but the biblical truth here is clear. You know, the, the notion is if God is in control, God is in control. And, you know, some people are gonna, uh, often ask, well, why do we have to insist on this doctrine of, of election? It causes so many problems. And, and I like how Tim Keller responds. He says, yes, election causes many difficulties. But the best reason for accepting the doctrine, I think he's not entirely right, the best reason is because Scripture clearly teaches it. But the best reason for accepting the doctrine is that every alternative creates even more problems and difficulty. And the first is this. Without election, you compromise the central teaching of the Bible that we are saved by grace alone, not by our works. If a difference between the unbeliever and the believer is ultimately in us, a greater humility, a greater openness, whatever, then we are the real authors of our salvation. Mercy, by its definition, cannot ever be an obligation. To say that mercy is unfair is to say that it is owed to all, but mercy is undeserved and thus totally free. To see Paul's argument to say that it is unfair for God to have mercy on some is a self-contradictory statement. Uh, Paul is reasoning, are you saying that God owes everyone salva anyone salvation? Of course not. He owes salvation to no one. He's free to give it to either all or some or to none. Nobody has any claim on God's mercy. And I love this. If they did, it would no longer be mercy. Since the wages of sin is death, the shock is not that God does not extend compassion to everyone, but that he extends it to anyone. Now, now let me say that in my humble opinion, the way to really fully understand why this is important to know uh, and understand is to understand God's great affirmation of God's grace that comes at the end of chapter 8. It is, in my opinion, the high watermark of the whole book. And you will have to wait until January for me to preach on it. But let me finish this morning with another uh, woefully inadequate illustration, um, and one that, once again, talks about some of my dogs. Nine years ago, I went to look at a litter of nine Labrador puppies. Um, I went there um, because I had lost my beloved lab uh, a few about a month earlier. I was lonely, and knowing that one of those had been reserved, but I had my choice of the remaining eight. I have to tell you that they were all beautiful, fun, active, engaging puppies. Um, that, that house was just chaos, by the way. Um, I played with them for over an hour and a half, and I finally picked one that the breeder had named Rebel Jack. Interesting enough, she even tried to talk me out of taking him. And I will say that Rebel Jack, who was renamed Hezekiah, was for three years one of the most difficult labs I've ever owned. Honestly, then and now, I'm not really sure why I chose him. But he is now my, my friend, my dog son, my Velcro lab. You would, you would miss the best part of the story if what you focused on was the puppies that I passed over. I don't know why God appears to have chosen me. 
as I look out over the vast span of humanity, there were lots of better choices than a rebel Al. Why am I a vessel of mercy? I don't know. To be honest, I think we can all say the same thing. So don't miss the wonder by looking at only the parts you can't fully get your arms around. Because for those of us in Christ Jesus, those who God knew even before time began, those who God chose even before time began, those who God called to receive his grace, those who are justified, that is granted forgiveness by his son's death on the cross, and finally those whom God will glorify, even as we give glory to our Redeemer, this is wonderful news beyond all comprehension. Nothing we could accomplish on our own. And you have to take note of the last promise, because I think sometimes we miss it. That's our glorification. And interesting, in, in the text, glorification there is actually in the past tense. It is so certain that it might as well have already happened. The links of these chain, golden chain cannot be broken. They all go together. James Denny puts it this way. The tense in the last word glorified is amazing. In, it is the most daring anticipation of faith that even the New Testament contains. So don't miss the wonder of God's grace for us. For God is working out all things for our good. And that, friends, cannot be broken. Let's pray. Father, this is, this is, a lot of this is, it seems like it's over our pay grade. But we just wonder at the fact that for reasons that only you know, before all of this began, you looked through time and you saw us and you knew us and you loved us and you chose us to be with you for all eternity. And you forgave us in Christ Jesus. And you redeemed us from sin. And you are preparing us to be like him as we are adopted as daughters and sons. And you promise that as you are glorified in the future, we will be glorified even now, but glorified even more then. And how wonderful and amazing that is. Thank you, God, for the parts of this we can understand and for the parts of it that we're still trying to grasp. We do pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, those of us chosen in Christ before time even began, go from this place, knowing that his love started before you began and will never end. And may that love, his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his blessing be with us now until the final day when we are all glorified together in him and with him. Amen.